Welcome to Bullet Point Nursing. My name is Dr. Goldstein, and in this lecture series, we're going to go through essentially everything you need to know for nursing pharmacology. Whether you're here as a nursing student, getting ready for the NCLEX, or getting ready for nurse practitioner school, I hope you find this series useful. In today's lecture, we're going to go ahead and we're going to wrap up cardiology that we've been discussing for the last few lectures. And today, specifically, we're going to talk about heart failure as well as anti dysrhythmic medications. The notes that we're using in this lecture can be found on our website, and I recommend you download them and follow along. So let's go ahead and begin with a pathophysiology review to understand the drugs that affect uh, the patient's heart and heart failure, and also in order to understand whatever pharmacology-related questions you may get on any exams that you have coming up. <clears throat> so first of all, let's understand the basics of heart failure. Heart failure is when the heart is not meeting the demands that is placed upon it. For example, if a patient's body needs their heart to pump a certain amount of volume throughout their body, but it is not meeting that, it is by definition failing. We have a quantitative formula for assessing how a patient's heart is doing. Just like any pump, it is evaluated based on its output, and the heart is evaluated by heart rate and stroke volume, which equal its output. It's critically important that you understand both this formula and its concept as it relates to pharmacology. So heart rate and stroke volume. Heart rate is how many times the heart beats per minute. Stroke volume is how much fluid the heart squeezes out with each stroke, with each beat. It's important to understand this because we have to understand that these are the two mechanisms that the body has that to equal our cardiac output. So let's put some numbers to it to help us understand. If a patient's body requires them to have a cardiac output of six liters, that's a relatively average number. So the patient's heart has to pump six liters per minute. So how can they do that? Well, they can do it by pumping 100 um, mLs with each squeeze and then 60 squeezes, 60 beats per minute. That would get us to the 6,000 cc's or six liters. One more time, if a patient's heart squeezes out 100 mLs of blood with every squeeze, and it does 60 squeezes a minute, 100 times 60, we have our 6,000 mLs or six liters. So that patient's heart is gonna be doing fine. If the patient's heart begins to fail, it's generally because the stroke volume is dropping and dropping. So instead of the heart squeezing out 100 mLs into the aorta with every squeeze, now it's squeezing out 90, 80, 70, so the cardiac output is dropping. Now the heart can compensate. If your stroke volume decreases, your heart rate can come up and we'll still get the same number, but that is A, counterproductive, and B, not a long-term solution. What do I mean by that? Well, if a patient's body is not delivering enough volume, if the heart is not delivering enough pumping, then I can increase my heart rate to compensate. However, if I increase my heart rate, that means the heart is having to do more work. If it has to do more work, then it needs more oxygen. If it needs more oxygen, it needs more blood flow. If it needs more blood flow, it needs to do more work. So it puts itself in a vicious cycle. Secondly, that's not a good long-term solution. We don't want the heart rate to have to go up and up and up. We would rather have efficient stroke volume. This is something that's really useful as an educator because we are all educated as nurses. This is something that's really useful to educate your patient on the importance of exercise. Because the heart is a muscle like anything else. And the more we exercise that muscle, the better it gets. In terms of the heart, the better it gets, meaning that the more volume it can push out with every squeeze. And if it's pushing out a lot of volume with every squeeze, then our heart rate can come down and down and down to a relatively safe number, getting it down to the 60s or 50s. And that shows a really healthy heart. A heart that has really good stroke volume doesn't need to beat as many times per minute. I like to say that the heart is only warranted for so many ticks. After that, it stops working. If I can have a really efficient heart that doesn't have to beat as many times per minute, then it can last longer. Heart failure is divided into two parts. We have heart failure with reduced EF and heart failure with preserved EF. You may hear this referred to as HEF-REF or HEF-PEF, heart rate or heart failure reduced EF or heart rate uh, preserved EF. In terms of pharmacology, we have three foundational drug classes that we use in treating heart failure. The first is a diuretic, the next is a RAS inhibitor, and the next is a beta blocker. 
And if you think about that, and if you've watched all the previous cardiac lectures, that makes perfect sense. Because in a patient that's failing, what do I want to do to help them? Well, number one, I want to reduce their workload. The heart's job is to pump around all the volume that we have. If I give you a diuretic, I get rid of some of that volume, I reduce the workload. Second, a RAS inhibitor. We know that's really good for promoting vasodilation, technically preventing vasoconstriction, but the effect is uh, promoting vasodilation. And if a heart is squeezing, if it has to squeeze its blood into a really tight aorta, that's going to be difficult for it, as opposed to if it gets to squeeze it into a vasodilated aorta, it gets much easier for it to push that load of blood up into the aorta. So that's the second thing that helps the failing heart. The third is a beta block. Why? Like we just said, if I lower the patient's heart rate, then two things. First of all, the less times the heart's beating, the less work it is doing, the less oxygen it needs, the less blood flow it needs, the less work it has to do. And second of all, if I space out my heartbeats a little bit further, I'm giving a little bit more blood a chance to flow into the left ventricle so that hopefully with each squeeze, it's going to be a little bit more productive. Think about it. If the heart is beating 150 times a minute, it barely got a chance to, to fill up before the heart goes and squeezes again. So there's barely any volume for the heart to push out. As opposed to if I slow it down, I gave another fraction of a second for some more blood to flow into the left ventricle. So when the left ventricle does squeeze, it is a more effective squeeze and that's how beta blockers help. So most patients that have heart failure are going to get placed on two or three of these medications, usually one, one drug in each of these three classes. When you're dealing with a patient that has heart failure, this is critically important that you educate the patient both on the disease itself and on the medications. We wanna educate them to ensure medication compliance because that's one of the top two causes of readmissions for heart failure. We also want them to follow their diet and um, exercise. We want them to keep an eye on their overall health. We want them to ensure that they're making all their follow-up appointments. Heart failure is difficult to manage. It has the highest readmission rate of any disease in patients over 65, uh, unless that's changed uh, recently, but that is the going statistic. It has a really high readmission rate. It also has a really high mortality rate. I think it's roughly a 50% five-year mortality rate for a patient diagnosed with full-blown heart failure. So let's talk about how we assess heart failure. We assess heart failure based on an ejection fraction. And that sounds a little bit complicated, but let's try and make it simple. Or I'll screw it up and make it more complicated. Let's find out. So when a patient has heart failure, we're talking that the pump is not squeezing as much as it should. It's not getting enough output. We said that heart output is based on the heart rate and the stroke volume. The heart rate, that's an easy number. We just look at the heart rate. The stroke volume is more difficult. So first of all, how do we know a stroke volume? Well, by far the most common way to evaluate a stroke volume is with an echocardiogram, also known as an ultrasound of the heart. Another way we can do it is we take a patient to the cath lab and in the cath lab, we can also determine what that number is. But what is ejection fraction? Because that's the foundation of how we diagnose someone with heart failure. Ejection fraction, is related to the stroke volume. But instead of it being a number of how many mLs the heart is discharging or the left ventricle is squeezing out with every contraction, ejection fraction is the percentage. So if 100 mLs of blood flow into the left ventricle and 60 get pumped out, then the patient has an EF of 60. And that's not bad. We want an EF to be about 55 to 70%. If a patient has a good, healthy heart, that number goes up a little bit we get to the higher end of normal, we get up to about 70%. The heart is not meant that if 100 mLs of blood flows into the left ventricle, that all 100 of that gets squeezed out up into the aorta. The heart gives a squeeze. It's like when we're doing um, breaths with the BVM. It's not meant to squeeze every last bit of air out of that BVM. Same thing here, the left ventricle is not meant to squeeze every last bit of blood out of there, but it's meant to get the majority. It's meant to get 55 to 70%. In a patient that's failing, that number starts to drop. So now the heart gives a squeeze, but that squeeze barely even gets out half or it gets out less than half. As the EF starts to drop, that's when we end up in a patient with heart failure. Again, that's gonna translate numerically into a lower stroke volume. But in terms of diagnosing with heart failure, we use ejection fraction one more time. Let's go through all those definitions. Heart rate, you already know. Stroke volume is the amount of MLs or CCs that the heart pushes out with each contraction. 
ejection fraction is the percentage of all the volume in the left ventricle that the left ventricle squeezes out with each contraction. Very closely related, but two different numbers. BNP, just so you know, is a very common lab that we use to assess if a patient's in heart failure. When that number is elevated, that means that a patient's heart is failing. BNP is, stands for brain natriuretic peptide or beta, B-type, beta-type natriuretic peptide. And what it is, it's something that the heart releases when it gets overstretched, when it's not functioning properly, when it becomes in failure. So in those cases, the BNP goes up, we can assess that on a lab. For test purposes, also, of course, make sure you know that the different signs and symptoms of heart failure, fatigue because the patient has no energy, orthopnea, they can't lie flat. Uh, they have difficulty breathing when lying flat, so they have to sit up. One of the most common, at least textbook and test-wise complaints of a patient heart failure is I have to sleep on three or four pillows, that I can't lay flat or else I can't breathe. Cough, again, because the lungs fill up with fluid. Why? Because the heart is backing up. It's failing, and that volume has to go somewhere. So if the pump is backed up because it's failing, it starts to back up and back up into the lungs. Exertional dyspnea, that I have trouble um, breathing every time I exert myself again, because when I exert myself, I'm even further increasing the demand of the heart, exacerbating the problem, things like that. Next, let's go ahead and let's start talking different pharmacology classes. I'm gonna go through some of these relatively quickly because we already discussed most of these in previous lectures. First, we begin with ACEs and ARBs. What do these do? These block the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. If you're not familiar with this, go back to our hypertension lecture to really brush up on it. These medications have two end results. One is that they block the body from holding onto fluid, therefore causing diuresis, but that's to a really small extent. To a much larger extent, they block the vessels from vasoconstricting, causing vasodilation. We already discussed how that helps the heart, the failing heart. If the heart is failing and its job is to push our blood into a tiny little thing, think of a coffee stir. If I open that up to a much bigger straw, then that would make it easier for the heart to pump the blood into it. ARBs do the exact same thing. It's just a different mechanism of action, but they have the exact same end result that they interfere with RAS. Both of these classes of drugs are teratogenic. And again, I'm going through it a little bit quickly here because we discussed it in previous lectures. Beta blockers also, of course, we discussed that in depth multiple times. It's the last time we're going to discuss it in our pharmacology series after we've already seen it with anxiety. We've seen it with um, angina. We've seen it so many times, but for one more time, different drugs that we have for heart failure specifically, we're going to use one of the beta blockers called carbetalol. It's not the only one that we use, but it is a really common one. And the interesting thing about carbetalol is we don't really use it for anything else. We pretty much only use it for heart failure. So if you see carbetalol on a med rack, you can pretty uh, well be safe that the patient has heart failure. Metoprolol is another one of the beta blockers. That one has multiple uses, um, and it is also used for heart failure as well. How does it work? Again, we just covered that, that by reducing the heart rate, I reduce the workload on the heart, making it that I don't need to pump as much because I'm not working as much. And secondly, by slowing down the heart rate, I'm increasing even a fraction of a second the time in between beats so that the heart can fill up a little bit more so that each contraction is a little bit more valuable, a little bit more effective so that I don't have to go up in my number of contractions, but I can make more effective contractions. Remember, heart health, when we exercise, when we do cardio exercise, that's what we're going for. We want our heart to be able to give a good, strong squeeze with each time so that it doesn't have to compensate by beating 100 times a minute. We would much rather have a patient's heart rate be at 60. In fact, a number of guidelines are starting to say that our resting heart rate should be 60 to 80, and we should uh, continue to keep 60 to 100 as a healthy heart rate, because when we get up to 80, 90, up to 100, that's really not a good, healthy heart um, in most cases. Obviously, stick to what your textbook says for now. Next drug class we're going to talk about are loop diuretics. Again, we said that there's going to be three foundational drug classes that we're going to use for heart failure. We said ACEs and ARBs, we said beta blockers, and now we're talking about a diuretic. We do have a few different diuretics, starting with loop diuretics. Again, we covered these just previously in the nephrology lecture, so I'm going to go through them a little bit quickly here. What are the drugs that we're talking about? Bumetanide, furosemide, um, and as well as several others. And these drugs are going to in, uh, block the body from reabsorbing sodium and chloride, thereby causing the body to keep the sodium and chloride in the nephron and out onto the bladder. And by keeping the sodium and chloride, heading off to the bladder, we're gonna keep the fluid heading off to the bladder, causing diuresis. How does this help? Well, if the heart's job is to pump around all of our volume, if I lower the volume, I lower the workload, 
If I lower the workload on a failing heart, I'm able to help out the failing heart. Another diuretic that we have are the potassium sparing diuretics. Those are the aldosterone antagonists. The drug over here is spironolactone. Spironolactone is very famous, especially for test purposes, known to cause hyperkalemia, which makes sense. It's a potassium sparing diuretic. So it holds on to potassium while getting rid of fluid, which makes the potassium seem relative to the amount of fluid and makes it seem high. This is also very famously known that it uh, interacts with ACEs and ARBs to cause even a higher potassium level. However, keep in mind, we can give those together, even though it is known that potassium sparing diuretics in combo with ACEs and ARBs can cause hyperkalemia. We do still routinely give them together. We just closely monitor the patient's potassium or educate them on non-farm interventions accordingly. So again, spironolactone is another diuretic that we popularly use in a patient that has heart failure. Um, and that's pretty much what it's used for. It's used for that and hypertension um, and edema, but it's primarily used for a patient that has heart failure. Next, let's talk about some drugs that are not necessarily for the three components that we just talked about, the beta blocker, the ACEs and ARBs, and the diuretics. Let's talk about a drug that just improves the function of the heart. So we have two drugs that really do that. Actually, we have three drug classes. Let's go through each of them. The first one are cardiac glycosides. Cardiac glycosides, by far the most common of these is going to be digoxin. This is available both in the hospital setting as well as in the um, PO setting for the chronic management. And what does it do? It increases the effects of calcium. So calcium, we know, is the most important ion in terms of the actual mechanical contraction of the heart. So when the heart actually gives a squeeze, calcium is the one that has most a play in that actual contraction. So digoxin increases the effects of calcium. By increasing the effects of calcium, it increases the strength of the contraction. It is also known, if you see it on tests, as increasing contractility or having increased inotropic effects. Either of those are acceptable terms. What is this drug used for? It's used for two things. It's used for dysrhythmias as an antiarrhythmic. We'll talk about that in about 10 minutes. And we're also uh, going to use this for heart failure, specifically with reduced DF, although you may see it with preserved EF. What are the adverse effects of this medication? It can cause nausea and vomiting. Especially note that this drug has a very narrow therapeutic index. And anytime you see that, remember for testing purposes, you know that a narrow therapeutic index A means the patient has a high likelihood of toxicity. B, it means the patient's uh, doses are gonna have to be carefully controlled and carefully titrated and tapered. C, it means that the patient's uh, gonna need labs very routinely monitored to make sure that they're not uh, becoming toxic with that drug or to make sure that it hasn't dropped below therapeutic effect. Digoxin has a very infamous uh, adverse effect, which is visual disturbances that tests love to ask about, such as um, seeing halos around lights or other visual disturbances. We know that when a patient's dig toxic, if they have too much digoxin on board, they can see um, halos around lights and have other visual disturbances. It is also known to cause bradycardia and dysrhythmias. Yes, I know it's ironic. It's used to treat dysrhythmias and it can cause dysrhythmias. That's just the tip of the iceberg because all of the antiarrhythmics we're going to see can do that. But it also knows, is known to cause bradycardia. Remember, that means that you have to assess the patient's heart rate prior to giving the patient a medication because it can lower their heart rate. Dysrhythmias, make sure that patient is on a cardiac monitor anytime you're treating a patient for a dysrhythmia, but especially if they're on a medication for it. We do have a reversal agent for this drug. Digoxin can be reversed with digoxin immune fab, and that can be used if the patient becomes dig toxic. They start to have that dysrhythmia, visual disturbances, et cetera. Another drug that we have, and this one is not for chronic long-term management. This one is in the hospital setting or the acute care setting. The drugs here we have are amrinone and milrinone. These drugs are phosphodiesterase inhibitors. And these drugs do two things. They increase contractility, so they don't work the same way as the JOXA, but they do the exact same thing, that they increase contractility, meaning they make the heart squeeze more effective. And the second thing they do is vasodilation. We already talked a little bit ago that vasodilation, what does that do in a patient with heart failure? It helps them because it makes it that the heart that's failing gets to push their blood into a much bigger opening, which is so much easier than having to push their blood into a really tight, um, opening. So it helps in two ways. What do we use this for? We use it strictly for heart failure. It does have adverse effects of causing dysrhythmias and hypotension. That makes sense if I vasodilate. That means I um, open up the blood vessels, make it bigger. 
That means I'm going to reduce a patient's blood pressure. Hopefully it only does it the correct amount to be able to help the patient but that is a known uh, issue with this medication. One more drug that we're gonna talk about is the butamine, but before we do, let's talk about a few others that are out there. These are both combination drugs. We'll start with Entresto is the brand name. This is one of the, considered one of the newest and best medications for the treatment of heart failure. It is still considered pretty expensive because it's new. The mechanism of action is two things. One is that it causes vasodilation and uh, it, or it causes vasodilation from two different routes. It causes vasodilation by direct vasodilation and by inhibiting RAS. So it has two ingredients. It has secubitril and valsartan. This medication is only used for heart failure. You may see it in some textbooks or some professors refer to it as an ARNI, just like we have ACEs and ARNs. We have an ARNI, which is this one drug, secubitril valsartan. Brand name is Entresto. This medication, just like all the ACEs, ARBs, et cetera, is considered not safe for pregnancy. It actually has an ARB in it, which is the reason for that. We have another combination drug that we're going to talk about. Is uh, brand name is Bidil, and the generic name is isosorbide dinitrate with hydralazine in it. You'll remember that isosorbide dinitrate and hydralazine, one dilates veins, one dilates arteries, so the two together work really well. Um, what do we use it for? We use this for heart failure, each of these individually. We may use separately hydralazine. We did discuss in the hypertension lecture as being used for that. But together, this drug, Bidil, is used for heart failure. It is definitely known that it can cause a headache just like any vasodilator. It can drop the blood pressure just like any vasodilator. It can cause orthostatic hypotension, reflex tachycardia. Make sure you remember the patient education that goes along with those adverse effects. Again, just like any vasodilator. We do have one other vasodilator that may be used in heart failure. Um, the medication is nitroglycerin. However, that was discussed in length in the angina lecture, which was our first cardiac lecture. This is our last one. So we can go ahead and discuss that there. For those of you that were watching from the beginning, we're right around the eight hour mark. And I did say that we'd be stopping at eight hours. However, unfortunately, I do still have more material. So you are free to stop watching here or you can stay with us. We've got about two hours to go in the series. So the next medication we're gonna talk about is dibutamine. Dibutamine we already discussed way back in one of our early lectures when we talk about adrenergic medications because the butamine is a beta-1 agonist. What does beta-1 do? Makes the heart be faster, harder, and stronger. So that's what this drug, which is perfect, just like digoxin, just like amarone, makes the heart be faster, harder, and stronger, again, through a different mechanism of each of the other two, but it has the same net effect. What do we use this for? We use it for acute decompensated heart failure. And this drug in this patient is generally used to give the patient more time for us to fix the underlying cause or the patient to heal from, let's say, an MI. This is not generally considered a long-term solution. This is IV only. This is ICU only. It is generally considered a vasopressor because it does have that beta-1 effects, that pressor support of the heart. Uh, this is not meant to increase the patient's blood pressure. It's just meant to help a patient whose heart is failing. This is generally going to be for a patient who's diagnosed with cardiogenic shock. And this is generally just going to be until we can figure out how to fix a patient's underlying problem or they heal themselves. Before we move on to the second half of this lecture and talk about dysrhythmias, really quick, since you're here still watching and hopefully enjoying this video series, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button. This channel is a free resource for all nurses, nurse practitioner students, and nursing students. Please go ahead and support us. All you have to do is hit that subscribe button and enjoy. So now let's get into the second part of our uh, last cardiology lecture. And over here, we're going to talk about dysrhythmias. So let's begin with a few definitions. Dysrhythmia means a bad heart rhythm. Arrhythmia means an abnormal heart rhythm. These two terms are usually used interchangeably. When we talk about a patient's heart rhythm, we're talking about the electrical activity of the heart. So there's mechanical activity, which is what we feel with a patient's pulse. But then there's also electrical activity, which is what we see on an ECG. A normal sinus rhythm is obviously what we consider normal or uh, the term for that also a lot of places have ditched using the word normal and just say SR or sinus rhythm. But then anything other than sinus rhythm is going to be considered an arrhythmia uh, or possibly a dysrhythmia or both. Some arrhythmias are expected and normal and healthy, such as if patient's resting heart rate, Lance Armstrong very famously in his heyday, his resting heart rate was in the 30s. But that's because he did so much cardio activity that his heart was so good, it only needed to be 30 times a minute to circulate all the blood volume that it needed to. 
On the flip side, a patient has a really unhealthy heart, their stroke volume is so bad that they need such a high heart rate to compensate. Or if a patient's exercising or stress or things like that also can cause a high heart rate. So bradycardia and tachycardia don't necessarily mean a bad thing. It could be that that's uh, perfectly normal as in the two examples I just gave. Um, one of the diseases that we're gonna talk most about is atrial fibrillation. Let's take a second and understand what that is. In a normal, healthy functioning heart, we have the atrium contract and then the ventricles contract. Atrium contract and the ventricles contract. They don't contract simultaneously or else they'd just be fighting against each other. It's the atrium and then a fraction of a second later, the ventricles. However, in atrial fibrillation, which is by far the most commonly treated abnormal um, heart rhythm and most of what we're gonna be talking about, in atrial fibrillation, the atrium start to quiver. They're no longer squeezing, they're just quivering. If they're quivering, they're not effectively pushing blood down to the ventricles as is the proper design of the pump. Since they're not doing that, that leaves us with a few problems. Problem number one is that it's not going to effectively fill the ventricles as well because that's their job is to fill the ventricles and they're not doing their job, they're just quivering. Secondly, if they're just quivering, then they're not keeping the blood moving at, in a proper manner. If they're not keeping the blood moving, the blood, if it's just quivering, the blood just kind of gets pushed and shoved and finds its way to wherever it's supposed to be, or it gets pushed and shoved and finds its way in a corner, pulls up a chair, some friends and a beer. And now a few particles of blood are all sitting together and they form a clot. So that's two separate problems that we have in a patient with atrial fibrillation. For both of those reasons, we want to make sure and treat it. One, because the heart's not going to pump as effectively. And two is because the patient's at a very high risk for developing a clot. Atrial fib is uh, diagnosed with, strict, with simply looking at an ECG, you get a 12 lead, you see a fib, patient has a fib. What are the symptoms of some of these dysrhythmias? The, dysry uh, the symptoms can be palpitations if let's say it's a really fast heartbeat. Um, they can uh, pass out, let's say from a slow heartbeat or an abnormal heartbeat if patients have multiple PVCs, things like that. They can be dizzy again because of in interrupted blood flow to the cerebrum. So there's lots of different systemic symptoms that a patient can have if they develop a dysrhythmia, it depends tremendously on what dysrhythmia we're talking about. Obviously, there are dozens out there. A dysrhythmia that requires or that causes something like atrial fib because of it not having the blood properly moving anymore, it's giving it a chance to coagulate. The patient may separately need to be on an anticoagulant. That's definitely fair game for a test, excuse me, at any level. Why? Because the patient. Um, is diagnosed with atrial fib, don't only be thinking about a dysrhythmic medication, they can also be requiring an anticoagulant medication. So let's go ahead and start to talk about these drugs. Antirhythmics are divided into four classes. We'll go through them in order. Class one is subdivided into three classes. So class one are all gonna be sodium channel blockers, but we divide them into 1A, 1B, and 1C. The first drug we're gonna talk about is procainamide. This in sodium we know is part of the one of the channels that is required for cardiac contraction by slowing the movement through the, so the sodium channel. We are going to slow down the heart rate, slow down the cardiac conduction. And by slowing things down, that's gonna be our common theme as we go through all of these drugs. That's gonna help the patient with an abnormal heart rhythm. Again, we're usually talking about atrial fibrillation, but by slowing down the heart rate is a common concept in how we fix dysrhythmias. These, this drug, procainamide, has been around for a very long time. It's not used as much as it was back in the day. It does have three black box warning. One is for lupus-like syndrome. For test purposes, make sure you know the symptoms of lupus, such as a butterfly facial rash, a positive A and A titer, things like that. It can also cause um, blood dyscrasies and proarrhythmic effects. All of these you're gonna see have a uh, chance of increasing a patient's risk of dysrhythmias. Class two or one B, we're still on sodium channel blockers, but we're just talking about a different one. This one's lidocaine. And this one has the same exact mechanism of action. It's used for the same thing. It has a different adverse effect. And again, for test purposes, make sure you know which is which. Lidocaine is known to cause CNS effects. When you see CNS effects, think things like confusion um, or things like that. This is contraindicated in patients with WPW with certain heart blocks. WPW is Wolf Parkinson's white. That's a specific dysrhythmia and certain heart blocks. Uh, especially if you're here watching this as a uh, paramedic, know that this is a very common test question of what medication cannot be given to a patient of heart blocks or what's required to be assessed prior to treatment with lidocaine, assessing a patient for heart blocks. 
Vidocaine also very famously is used as a numbing agent um, in completely different settings that we're not discussing today. Still on calcium channel blockers, we have class 1C antiarrhythmics, and these are flecainate and propanone. Hopefully I'm pronouncing those correctly. I'm not a thousand percent sure. The mechanism of action, same as we've been discussing, indication, same. This one has two different black box warnings. These are the two newest of the sodium channel blockers, and most of the guidelines do list this one as the preferred sodium channel blocker, one of these two. The two black box warnings that it have, one is that it can cause prorhythmic effects. Again, pretty much all of the antiarrhythmics can cause arrhythmias, which I guess, whether you look at it as counterintuitive or simple, either way, on the one hand, if I'm treating something, it probably shouldn't cause it. On the other hand, if I'm messing with the patient's arrhythmia to fix it, I still have a chance of messing with it adversely. And finally, consideration for increased mortality. If you haven't seen this before, what it means is before you give this drug, don't just look at, oh, it's going to make the patient's heart rate look all nice and pretty. Look at the data of whether it actually helps survival. Because some things, very famously, the practice of giving vasoconstrictors to patients that are bleeding out in trauma, yes, it might bring the patient's blood pressure up to nice, pretty 120 over 80, but studies have shown that that does nothing to increase the patient's survival. So does that really help the patient? That's what this means, black box warning consideration for increased mortality. Don't just think, is it going to help the patient's arrhythmia this minute? Think about, is it actually going to help the patient's long-term mortality and survival? If not, then have that in mind when you're prescribing it. Again, that's probably above the RN level, but we do absolutely teach black box warnings at the RN level. The applicability of that would be more at the MP or MD level. Next, we have our second class of antiarrhythmics. These are beta blockers. We just talked about this a few minutes ago in the heart failure section of this lecture, as well as multiple times previously. I'm not going to go over it again. Just know that beta blockers are the class two antiarrhythmics. And obviously, all the things you have to know about beta blockers we covered. If not, please go back and look at one of the many lectures where we discussed that. I think in the hypertension lecture, we went the most in depth to it. I will point out the black box warning here, abrupt discontinuation can cause adverse effects. Think about it. If a patient's heart got used to functioning with a beta blocker on board, and all of a sudden I stop taking the beta blocker and there's a ton of extra beta stimulation being put on the heart, putting a ton of extra stress on the heart. It's certainly understandable how that could cause a patient to have adverse cardiac effects, such as developing an MI or heart failure. So do know that because it does relate to this lecture. Everything else about this drug, we definitely discussed previously. The next class of drug we have is the class three antiarrhythmics. These are also known as potassium channel blockers. And this is probably one of the most used antiarrhythmics, and the drug here is amiodarone. And how does it work? Well, it blocks potassium channels. So just like when sodium channels get blocked, same thing here. When potassium channels get blocked, it helps improve the patient's, or it helps slow down the cardiac activity. And by slowing down the cardiac activity, I can hopefully uh, gain some control of this dysrhythmia. Adverse effects of this drug, it does have a whole bunch. It can cause bradycardia, it can cause hypotension, it can cause arrhythmias, it can cause hepatotoxicity and pulmonary toxicity. In fact, it has black box warnings for those, both the pulmonary toxicity and the hepatotoxicity. The third black box warning, same we've been seeing all over again, is the proarrhythmic effects. This medication is teratogenic. It cannot be given in pregnancy. This medication also must be uh, educated to the patient to avoid grapefruit juice because it can have increased effects um, with grapefruit juice. We want to have the patient avoid it. Obviously, because it's an, an antiarrhythmic, make sure you're monitoring the patient's heart rate, make sure you assess their blood pressure prior to treatment. And finally, this medication is well known that it has one of the longest durations of any medication out there. Depending on what textbook you look at, it could be anywhere from about 40 to 50 days to several months that it has its duration. Next drug we have is the class four antiarrhythmics. And this will be the last class of antiarrhythmics and it's calcium channel blockers. Again, we've discussed this multiple times previously because what's this drug used for? It's used for a whole bunch of things. It's used for angina, it's used for hypertension, and now we see it here. How does it work? Again, just like sodium channels, just like potassium channels, calcium channel blocking is going to slow down cardiac activity and it's going to um, improve cardiac uh, functioning. Also note, and in this case specifically, we talked dysrhythmias, it can gain control of the dysrhythmia. Please note calcium channel blockers do come in two types. There's the dihydropyridines and the non-dihydropyridines. These are the non-dihydropyridines. The dihydropyridines, that would be amylodipine or dicarbine, those would do nothing to help with an arrhythmia because those don't affect the heart. Adverse effects, same as we've been seeing the whole day uh, the, for dysrhythmias.
Next and last, let's talk about adenosine. Adenosine is a really interesting drug. You for sure learned about this in AMP or bio, and that is it's ATP, adenosine triphosphate, ATP. So how does this drug work? A simple way to think about it is imagine if someone was outside of wherever you're at right now and they're throwing around money. Well, you wouldn't, know, you wouldn't be here anymore. You would be out there grabbing that money. Same thing here. What this drug does, it's giving, putting a ton of ATP into the blood vessels. Now our body works hard to develop ATP, goes through the Krebs cycle, gets 32 to 36 units and on and on like you already learned. However, in this case, if I just inject ATP, everyone sees free energy, free money, and all the cells stop what they're doing and they grab up, they gobble up all that ATP. So what does it do? It temporarily stops automaticity and production. It essentially pauses cardiac activity. If you look at an ECG, when a patient gets this, you're going to see a flat lung. So there's a whole bunch to know about this drug. First of all, a patient must be on a cardiac monitor and you should have an ECG strip printing in order to uh, gain the full benefit of this medication as I'm gonna discuss in a second. What do we use this for? We use it for tachydysrhythmias only and we use it for one of two things or both. We use it to slow down the heart rate, either to get it to slow down because it's too fast and I don't want it to be going that fast, or I wanna get it to slow down for the purpose of, I wanna see what the QRS complex is. Because when I give this to a patient with tachydysrhythmia, they have a heart rate 160, 170, 180. I can't really see what I'm looking at. The P, the Q, the R, S, T, it's all right on top of each other. If I slow it down, now I get to actually see what the P, Q, R, S, T look like. And for those of you that know how to read ECGs, that gives us a ton of information that I didn't previously have. So by giving this patient the drug, hopefully their heart rate slows down and it's no longer fast like it was. But even if it speeds right back up, it will slow it down at least for a few seconds. And in those few seconds, again, that's why we're printing the ECG. The physician or the NP is able to look at it and be able to make a determination on some diagnostic uh, value by looking at that. This medication, in contrast to the last one that we talked about, amiodarone, this one actually has the shortest half-life in all of pharmacology. You made it eight and a half hours in. This is where we have the drug with the shortest half-life under 10 seconds. Why? Because every single cell is gobbling it up. It's gone almost as quick as it came in. Because it's gone so fast, we should give it as centrally as possible. This isn't something you ideally want to be pushing through an IO or a peripheral, uh, a far peripheral access. You would much rather be doing it through the AC, through a, um, a, a central line if possible, or through an IJ, something like that, to get it to have the best chance of having its effect. You should educate your patient. You are going to feel a very funny sensation in your heart because presumably since you were born, your heart has never stopped beating before. It's about to warn your patient. Also warn the other people in the room. This patient is going to flatline for a few seconds. It will come back, at least it's meant to. Um, and it's very weird for that to have that, uh, an issue with that. This is also referred to as a chemical conversion. If you uh, learned ACLS, you know that when we do synchronized cardioversion or other things, same concept where we're trying to um, pause a patient's heart so that they start back up at a proper speed. Same concept here, just over here, we're doing it chemically. Finally, before we wrap up this final lecture in cardiology, let's make a few quick points about dysrhythmias. Number one, sometimes all the medications are not going to help. They need electricity, so they need cardioversion or defibrillation to fix it. Depends on what their rhythm is, which one is more appropriate. Um, magnesium and other electrolytes may be both the cause of a patient's dysrhythmia and the cure for a patient's dysrhythmia. So some dysrhythmias, um, so for example, torsades, and we're not getting into learning a whole 12 week ECG course here, but that is treated with magnesium. On the flip side, if a patient has an electrolyte imbalance like potassium, that can cause dysrhythmia as a really high potassium. So just recognize that, that sometimes, especially if you see it in test questions, pay extra attention to it because that question might be just testing you um, to make sure you understand that certain electrolytes, actually most of them, can cause cardiac dysrhythmias. And on the flip side of that, sometimes it can be used to fix it. Finally, I already mentioned this several times with each specific medication. Every patient who's being treated for dysrhythmia should be on a cardiac monitor when in the acute care setting. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great day.